Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, longtime drummer for Texas Troubadour, Robert Earl Keen, and many others, Tom Van Skyke. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, folks? Yep, it's that time. Your iPhone's correct. Your wristwatch is correct. Your Fitbit is correct. It's a, it's that time. It's a time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redmond Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. I always try to bring you the good stuff. You know, I got a lot of drummer friends, and we're just always the most enthusiastic. We're the biggest characters. We have the best time. And today is going to be no different. I have a longtime friend. He's the drummer to the stars, living in Austin, Texas. And for the last 25 years, 4 months and 26 days he has been the touring and recording drummer with celebrated singer-songwriter Robert Earl Keane just finished up his farewell tour. My friend Tom Van Skyke, what's up, bud? How's it going, man? Oh my god, this is so fun. You know, we just saw each other um at the Percussive Art Society International Convention. We got to hang out a little bit. I like to go to that thing every year because it's just a great way to like press the flesh and see people you haven't seen in forever. And that is you, man. I haven't seen you in so long. Wasn't that fun? It was fun. That was, that was actually, that was a blast. I mean, it was great to see you. And, uh, I mean, we, we hung out and had a lot of laughs and, <laughs> and saw some great clinics too. In, That's in right. The process. Man. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was like the first one that I've been able to go to in like 15 years. You know why? Because you're a working drummer. <laughs> I know. I know. It's, it's, uh, you know, I, I missed going to that because it's always inspirational. You always leave that that convention feeling, you know, good about what you do and just being inspired to do new and different things and, and all of that. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, it was a blessing, sort of a blessing and a curse that, you know, I was I was touring so much that I couldn't do that. Yeah. You know, so when Robert retired in September, I was just like, man, I am. I put that on my calendar and made my hotel reservations like October 1st, man. I was, I was so going to be there. That was great. And, and for the folks that aren't in the know, the Percussive Arts Society International Convention, PASIC, is the convention for this um, professional organization that we call the Percussive Arts Society. Been around a long, long time. And it's basically just a convergence of, you know, like-minded professional drummers and percussionists. So any, anybody that beats, rattles, scrapes, shakes something at a um, hobbyist level, at a intermediate level, at a professional level, um, educate, college educators, professional touring, we all get together and we kind of like do these clinics and we get together and we talk shop and we break bread and and uh it is just a great thing so check that out uh the percussive art society if you're a drummer or percussionist you should join but listen before we get too far into some of these backstories because there are so many backstories and i know i owe so much of my nashville success to you and that is a story unto itself but look at just some of these other people that you have played with one of the things that I see on your website is you also worked, in addition to Robert Earl Kane for 25 years, you also worked with bands like Cross Canadian Ragweed, Bo Diddley, Ricky Skaggs, Leanne Womack. You got to tell me about this Austin City Limits all-star band where you get to back up folks like, you know, slackers, um, newbies like Bonnie Raitt. <laughs> You know, Bonnie Raitt, Shell Crow, Jeff Bridges, Chris Christopherson, Taj Mahal, Willie Nelson, Rodney Krell, Elvis Costello. I mean, that all had to be fun. Tell me about that. I mean, still, these are folks, they pay taxes and put their jeans on one leg at a time, right? I mean. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's that's one of the coolest parts of it is just being able to, a lot of those artists I've looked up to and listened to for years. And to be able to meet with them and work with them and, you know, we're sitting next to each other in catering and I'm listening to Bonnie Ray just rattle off all these influences that she had. And I was just like, you know, and, you know, and it always has those moments of disbelief. Like there was one uh, when Bonnie was being inducted, um, I was sitting behind the kit during rehearsals and um bonnie was right in front of me and taj mahal was to my left and mavis staples was to my right and i was like going 
what the hell am I doing here, man? You know, this is so beyond belief. You know what you're doing there. You're keeping the beat and protecting the beat and laying down the beat and playing all the right things at the right time with a smile on your face. And, I mean, and that's a skill set, you know, and, and I I just want to take you, we'll get back to that, you know, I mean, working with celebrities and maybe advice you have for working with celebrities, especially when you have to do it under the gun. Sometimes there's no rehearsal, there's no sound check, you're just doing it. Cameras are rolling, millions of people are watching. Um but I moved to uh, Louisville, Texas, Denton, Texas, the Dallas, Texas area in 1993. You were one of the first folks I met. And I'm here I am at school oh, wow. trying, trying to get this master's degree, trying to study with Ed Sof and Ron Fink and Robert Chitroma and Henry Oxtell. You know, a lot of, a lot of guys you'll probably have something to a say about. Buddies, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and you came in strutting in. You were wandering the halls and you had your this shiny Dixie Chicks jacket on, Dixie Chicks tour jacket. And you and I went to like like Tia's Mexican or something. But what I loved about hanging with you is that, A, you, you, you weren't you were so giving and embracing the younger guys. Like I was a guy that was like, I want to do what you're doing. So I don't know how I'm going to do it. Cause right now I'm dealing with this academia, but I have the evenings free. I can get down to Dallas, <laughs> Texas. I can go pr- play poor David's pub. I can maybe go to fatso's and fill in for you, you know, but at the time, Three teardrops. Yeah. Three teardrops. Oh balloons. my, yeah. yeah. You were, um, you were the original <laughs> drummer with the Dixie chicks. Now, how did that, yeah all happen um gosh i had actually i was actually doing some theater work playing in pit pit orchestras and one of the founding members robin macy um on one of the shows i was doing she was playing lead in uh oh god what was the name of that show the dames at sea which wasn't a huge musical but you know um, you know, it was one of those, everybody's tap dancing, you know, kind of musical things. Um, so between rehearsals and, and the run of the show, we, you know, we kind of got to know each other. And, and, uh, so when the, when the run ended, we, everybody sort of goes their own separate ways and gone to the next show. And it was, gosh, I guess it was probably maybe three or four years after that that I was looking through the Dallas Observer, the local rag, and I saw that this band was playing down this place called Joey Tomatoes, which was a a Italian restaurant on McKinney Avenue. Oh my God. And, and they had a picture and it was the, all the, the Dixie chicks. And, and I was like, Oh my God, that's Robin Macy. So it was just like, man, I got to go say hi to her. I haven't seen her a long time. You know, we, we always got along great. So I went down there and, uh, you know, said hello to her and sort of introduced myself to the rest of the band. And um, I just, you know, I listened to their first set and it was just mind blowing. I mean, they're all great players and their harmonies were incredible. And and so, you know, as I was talking to him, I was just like, hey, you know, it's it's a far far fetched thing. But if you ever want to put drums on anything. Here's my card. Oh, so there was you no know, drums can, yet. It was just banjo. Um, it was fiddle, guitar, and upright bass. That's right. Yeah, it was just four girls playing bluegrass and western swing. And they were all in these, like, cowgirl prairie outfits and all kinds of stuff. I, rem- the, I remember that era, man. And and they were attractive, oh, yeah. attractive girls, man, you know, which always helps. You know, which always helps. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I gave him my card and then like a month later, um, they had already put out one record and they wanted to put out a 45 of two Christmas songs that they wrote. And so they were just like, Hey, we want to put drums on this. And so it, it, we had like one pre-production sort of rehearsal, um, over at Robin's house. And so in the, you know, after we got done rehearsing the two tunes and everybody was happy. And, uh, you know, a couple of the, uh, Marty and Emily, actually, they were just like, hey, let's try this song with drums just for the heck of it, you know. Um, and then it led into another thing and another thing. And it was, you know, I was there for like an extra hour and a half just playing, you know, pretty much all their set. And um, so I went and did the session. And then probably a month after that, they called me up and they said, Hey, we're opening for Michael Martin Murphy at the Mesquite arena and we want you to come play. So I was just like, okay, great. You know? So I listened to their CD, learned all their tunes, 
And again, had one rehearsal. We went in there and, and played the show. And then I guess that was probably like November. Um, and then by, gosh, I guess beginning of January, I, I was decided to hire me and work full time with them. And, and, and that relationship was, was uh, yeah, how long? I forget. Uh, like five and a half years, something like that. Yeah, I thought you guys were balling because you had the RV, man, and you were out there doing it. <laughs> I mean, I was like, I want, whatever that is, the smell of diesel and, and like oh, ta yeah. taking the music to the people. I want to do that. And and I was fortunate one time. You, This is unbelievable. And thank you. You trusted me, this young whippersnapper. I filled in for you a couple times. And it was the first time I ever played behind the sneeze guard, the blast shield, right? Because oh, yeah. I'm sure that they were sensitive to volume, right? So a lot of brushes and plastics. Yeah, I mean, probably, gosh, probably for the first year, well, at least, well, I guess about the first year, I didn't even play sticks. It was just mainly brushes, rods, all kinds of stuff, just, uh, you know, because they weren't used to playing with a drummer. I mean, yeah. you know, it, it, was, it was a learning experience, and for me, sort of a teaching experience of like, you guys have to listen to me. You know, it's just because they're typical blue, bluegrass stuff. They're just, just, you know, they're... It's and the tempo just takes off, and they're just like you know, turn around, going what? What? You know, it's like okay, no, so you had you had to it. train them. You had to literally, yeah. like, politely, yeah. persistently, with a smile on your face, train them to play the yeah. same tempo for three and a half minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it worked out because they got a record deal. Hey, you know, I'm not yeah. saying it's because of me, but uh. <laughs> amazing. It's it, bro. I mean, it, it, the, but, but that's what I remember. And I remember, you know, kicking around Dallas with you and Dallas, you know, Dallas, man, it I I can't really say enough about the scene in Dallas. It's probably similar nowadays in the sense that it's a big enough metro metropolitan area with all these great colleges that are feeding that infrastructure that there i mean there was like soul horn bands there was all those top slick top 40 bands the emerald cities of the worlds and and then there was the singer songwriter poor david's pub thing and just tons of working bands big bands like some fusion smooth jazz a lot of stuff man it was a pretty healthy scene it was a great scene actually um because i started i mean i started working God, when i was like 17 so that was probably like 83 something like that. Um, I was just like senior year in high school is when I started kind of playing around and started doing stuff. And through the whole time I was in Dallas, I mean, the scene, the scene was a lot different then than it is now, obviously, because I haven't there been there enough to like, see like what's going on. Cause I, I, I know that you could still pop by the Addison playground off of Beltline road there. You go into club Memphis. There's still bands yeah. seven, seven days a week. Which is incredible. Yeah, yeah, but I, I think that I mean, and I think it's it's pretty much like this in in a lot of cities, you know, because I think it's more industry wide that the the days of you know sort of just being playing a club circuit and making enough money to where you can buy a house and support your family. Um, it seems those days have kind of passed. Interesting that you say that because I remember. You know, so the years for me in Dallas would have been 93 to 97. So in that amount of time, I did everything humanly possible that you could do in the scene. The mega churches, the the jingle sessions, the playing on Mondays for the, in the original band, and then Wednesday through Sunday, you're with the cover band. But it was like 80 bucks here, 50 bucks there, 120 bucks there. It still was like a grind to make about a teacher salary, maybe like $25,000, you know? Yeah, I mean... I think probably in the eighties, it might've been a little bit stronger. Um, I mean, by the time the nineties hit, I, I started with the chicks when I it was like 91, something like that. But there was, I mean, there was, there was like a circuit of country Western clubs um, between Dallas and Fort Worth to where um, if you got onto that circuit with an artist, you know, you can make really good money. You know, um, and it was just like, you know, it's local. You're still in town. You're seeing your kids every day. You're not having to, you know, bust ass on the road, you yeah. know, six months out of the year or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I did, I remember, you know, 
those, those times because I, I knew guys who, you know, and, and probably some of the guys that you mentioned, like the guys who were playing in Emerald City and they were doing some other stuff, they were sort of, you know, in an upper of uh, an upper echelon of that yeah. circuit, you yeah. know. And if you could get into that, man, you know, like I said, you could you could make a decent living. Yeah, those guys were those were guys were treating themselves to like you know fresh duds at Chess King all the time, man. You know because <laughs> <laughs> they were working they were working like twenty five days a month, man. You know locking with oh, hand, yeah. hand claps and electronic shakers, and it's yeah. it was a, it was a great training ground for me. And I and I do remember hanging out with you know Rachel Getz and and uh, and Milo Deering, and you know there's that there was that thing that alt country thing, um, and you know it's so funny is I. I, I never. I don't think I've ever asked you this. Where are you originally from? Are you originally from Texas? No, actually, I was born in New Hampshire. Oh my God! Live free or die, man. Yeah. I was wear your seatbelt if you want. You know, don't wear it if you don't. <laughs> wear your motorcycle helmet if you want. Don't wear it. Yeah. You, you know. Yeah. Okay. No, I was. Uh, I was. I grew. I sort of spent the first ten or eleven years of my life up in New England, uh, between Vermont, New Hampshire, and Connecticut. Oh my God, and, man! That's uh, crazy. Yeah, yeah, and then my dad got a teaching gig down in Dallas when uh, when I was going into the fifth grade, I guess. Oh my God, and, mind blown, uh, that's, dude! That's that's when, that's when I moved down to Dallas. Yeah. So, because I'm a Canadian, I the first eleven years of my life in Connecticut, and then my dad gets a job in El Paso, Texas, when I was eleven in the fifth grade. Do we have the same story? We're East Coast guys. Oh my God! We ended up in Texas because, but I just was I was just like inspired by what you were doing at the moment. We never talked. So that leads you to um, UNT. Now, you did you study yeah. with all those guys that I mentioned? How was that time there? Um. It was great. Um, the I, my, I think my last semester was Soph's first semester. Ah. Um, so I only got to uh, spend like one semester studying with him. But who was the drum set teacher um, before that? Before Ed? Um, Ox, Henry Oxdell. Oh, he was the head. Oh, gotcha. Then, gotcha. Yeah, he was. He was the main guy. Um, of course, I studied with uh, you know some of the grad students like Randy Drake, who's a great drummer. Um, then there was Mike actually, Drake. There was Mike Drake too. Yeah, um, yeah, he was. He was actually. He he and I, I think were in the same class, so he wasn't teaching up there at that point. Um, but yeah, Randy was great, and he actually got me my first country gig, um, which I thanked him for. I saw him at the UNT reunion uh, a couple months ago. Yeah, did you go like, to the, the celebration of the seventy-five years of the jazz program? Cool, yeah, man. it was amazing. It was amazing. And you, and you mentioned that it was interesting because you mentioned the teachers. Um, I could listening. They had the lab bands from like the sixties and then the seventies reunion band, eighties, nineties, aughts, two thousand tens, whatever. Um, and so each decade they had a, a separate lab band performing in this one concert. And I could tell just the way the drummers were playing who they studied with. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, because I, each each one had their own style. I mean, everybody who came up with me through Henry and, of course, Ron Fink was, you know, teaching there at the time. And Colin Bailey was up there a little uh, some, too, which I got to study with him. Yeah. Um, but those guys had and we had a different style of playing than when Ed Sof took over. And then, you know, I could tell when Ed, you know, when Ed left. You know, the it was like the the next feel of drummers came yeah. in. It was it was really interesting, and I even talked to uh, uh, Do you know Leanne Harris? To, she was a percussionist. Yeah, so she was in the she yeah she was a percussionist in the one was out in L.A. for a long time, um, but she was up there at the same time I was, and I saw her at the reunion, and we were kind of talking about the same thing. It was now, just did you like, did you do a little playing? Did you get to play with the, one of the bands? I didn't. I didn't. Because I, I feel didn't. bad, man. I feel bad that I didn't go. Like, I knew that was coming up because I've been in, in touch with some of the administrators because – UNT, they're trying to push it forward and where they're pushing commercial music and a music business program a little bit more than they have. There was a little bit of a, I mean, obviously, it's such a world-renowned university, but more based in traditional percussion ensemble pedagogy and yeah. and 1950s jazz up. 
And now they're like, well, what about the popular music? And what about what about people that want to be in the music business but don't play a musical instrument? So I've been in contact with the administration, but I should have like figured out like something massive was going to happen, and I should have. But I was working was, anyways. I think. Oh you no! Know? Yeah, I mean, there you go. Back to the you know black. Back to the blessing and the curves. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it was interesting going up there because. Um, walking around camp or walking from where I had to park up to the music building, everything had changed. I, I used to live in these, this, uh, you know, roach infested apartments down by West hall. Yeah. And you know, it was just, they were horrible. But what was the rent? All. What was the rent back then, man? Oh my God. I, I don't even remember, man. It was super cheap. I know that. <laughs> I, I, but I do remember it, a time where like the entire month's bills were like, were like 500 bucks, you know, like what? Oh, what easy, a great time. Easy. Yeah. I mean, it was, and, and that was the thing. It was like super cheap to, to, to live there in Denton, but it was also, you know, cause I was in state. So it was super cheap to even go there. I mean, you know, it's not like these days to where you're racking up 20 grand a, a year on tuition and shit. You know? Oh, my God. But, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it was interesting because all of those places, my apartments were torn down. It's a new rec, rec center for the for the students. You know, the Texas, uh, what was it, Texas Pickup, which is this burger joint that was down on University Boulevard. That was gone. All my sort of landmarks were gone. Yeah. But the moment I stepped into the music building over by where Lab West was, it was just like it took me back 35 years. That brown brick, that light brown the brick. brown everywhere. brick and walking in there and, the, and everything looked the same. They had still had the bulletin boards up with, you know, f you know, symbol for sale. And I want to, you know, we're looking for this. and Come see my gig. Yeah. I mean, everything was, everything was the same. And it was just like, it, it sort of like, you know, gave me this weird feeling, you know, yeah. it's just like well, a step back in time. Well, all this time has passed. And when you realize it it, 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 it can be some sort of an interesting pinch me moment because it's just so fun to be talking to you and, and to know that, you know, we're like, oh God, decades like three decades have gone by you know of oh, manifesting yeah. our dreams and going out there and taking the music to the yeah. people speaking of which did you the blessing and the curse did you ever um have kids um i had a stepdaughter in my first marriage ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, uh, yeah uh, she's she's been a part of my life since she was like four four or five or something like that and um she's back living in dallas she was in, lived in new york for about god 10 years 15 years something like that wow. and then moved back got married and they just adopted a new baby so um so yeah and, and but nothing nothing biological but i think of her as my daughter anyway so i love that well i'm sure you're a good role model if you guys are watching this video you can see that um tom has books behind him but if you're just listening to this tom <laughs> is a drummer with wives. books <laughs> <laughs> my wife my wife is a forensic psychologist so most of these are like you know serial killers and oh my know, god sort interesting of all kinds of yeah so are you guys all always watching that stuff. first 48 hours and all those crime reenactment shows and all that kind of stuff it was weird when we first started dating um she was like really into all that stuff and you know and you know one of my first thoughts was just like you know, am I going to end up dead at the end of a date at some point? <laughs> or is, you know, it's just like, are these how to book, how to things or what's she planning? But, yeah. uh, but no, she, she worked, uh, she was a professor at UT for like 13 years, 13, 14 years. And then, um, she's been, uh, working as a forensic psychologist in the family and criminal justice departments. So. Damn smart. <laughs> That's good. super smart I'm, I'm wondering what you know again it's like what the hell am i doing here i feel you know? the same way i like what i'm drooling i'm like what's for dinner um <laughs> <laughs> well good for you man and now you're in um austin what what's the scene like comparatively to your to your dallas or to your nashville um it's an active scene it's it's like everywhere i think it's still adjusting to the post-covid um it really really hit austin hard 
in the fact that there was a lot of musicians in the scene that were sort of barely hanging on to the point to where they could live in Austin um, um, and work in Austin and with the COVID. And then it was interesting during COVID and just post COVID, the, like everywhere else, property values went through the roof. Right. And so there was a recent music um, uh, census that was taken and they, and basically like 70% of the music musicians who work in Austin have to live outside of Austin, mm. which doesn't really help to create a scene. You know, it's, um, you know, if you're having to drive 30 to 40, 40 minutes to get home or to the gig, the chances of you hanging out and watching the next band or going to another place to, you know, see another band, they're pretty minimal, you know? And, right. um, David Byrne had wrote this one book called, uh, I think it's called how music business works or something like that. Mm. And one of the chapters was about creating a music scene in the business, you know, as in the, in a city. And one of the things he said, you have to sort of live in the same area that you're playing. And, you know, the clubs, you know, like he said, like down at CBGB's back in the day, if, you know, the talking heads weren't playing, but, you know, Patty Smith was playing the, you know, everybody knew each other. So they just let him in. No problem. Right. You know, and, and it's kind of like that, you know, in a couple places, you know, um, like over at Saxon pub and continental club there, you know, the ladies at the back door, they'll, they'll know you. And it's just like, Hey, come on in, whatever, you right. know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's for this, for the scene, it's a little bit more difficult now, especially post COVID. Um, it's never been like a really high paying scene for because the thing that sort of attracted me to Austin is, as opposed to the way the Dallas scene used to be the Dallas scene, you could play the clubs, but 90% of the stuff was, you know, all cover music. Yeah. You know, you're just playing cover bands. It was, it's always been the opposite here in Austin to where they embrace original music. But unfortunately that doesn't, have the same sort of pay happening. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, um, so yeah, I mean, it's still a vibrant community. Um, I've actually in the last couple of years, um, been working with not only the, the musicians union, but this other organization called Austin, Texas musicians Oh, cool! that we, um, advocate for the music community, the musicians, um, club owners, all that stuff. We're an advocate, advocacy uh, organization for City Hall and even to the state in getting things passed. Um, we got a, a thing passed that for the first time in God, 40 or 50 years, you know, well, in Austin history, the, the city council voted to actually directly invest money into the music scene. Wow. Which they'd been, you know, they're, they've been living under the moniker of, um, you know, the live music capital of the world for like 40 or 50 years and never did anything to help the musicians out. Yeah. And so we started making some noise and raising our voices and organizing and doing a bunch of stuff. And they finally committed to this new part, part of a new hotel tax that they were going to implement that was going to go straight into the music scene and not just disperse out to other things. Yeah. I mean, that's that, I mean, that's great that you're involved with something like that because, you know, something as simple as like, you know, you call Nashville music city and you've got, uh, I don't know, something like 50 nightclubs that are down. That's lower Broadway. Like, I'm, mm -hmm. and uh, the, you know, the cops were getting, uh, getting tough with the musicians trying to load and unload their gear. And so now it's just, 
it's this crazy thing where the musicians have like a dedicated garage where they get a discount, but now you you got to have some sort of like a Santa sleigh or rock and roller, you know, rolling device to get your amps and your drums. And you know, for drummers, you know, we got we got a lot of times we like our own cymbals, we like our own pedal, we like our own snare drum. Like before you know it, I mean, you're taking half the kit and you got to get it down there to the club, schlepping it around. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, they were doing the same thing in Austin with, you know, and we're, we've actually have um, six designated musician loading and unloading zones now. Um, we're actually working um, with the Music Commission trying to get um, free uh, parking for musicians downtown. Because, you know, even the discount, they had a discounted parking thing, but it was only you know, out of the six city owned garages or whatever in the program, you know, you could pay a monthly discounted fee, but it would only be that one garage. And it was just like, this doesn't work because if you're playing over at this place, it doesn't matter if you can park over here. They, it's, they, it's they don't get still it. A schlep. Yeah. That's why they need guys like you. Well, that that's great that you're involved with that, man. That it's, you know, at some time, at some point we all want to get involved with the give back. And I just want to thank you again, just personally and, and publicly, I remember when I made the move to Nashville, I was like, I know no one. And I just had to figure out how to shake some trees. You're like, hey, man, I met this gal, um, uh, you know, at this uh, Jay Alexander's. It used to be something else, probably. And she She's really connected in the scene, and she she might know this. Other, and I think you introduced me also to Judy Seal, who was really in charge of, like, putting um, – okay. Uh, like artist tours together to go play military bases. So I ended up going to play like 20 military bases, like all over the world because you're like, call this person. So I call cold called her, you know, which a lot of people are not brave enough to do. Cold called her. I said, can I bring my little resume and cassette demo tape together? She's like, yeah, bring it, bring it today if you want. So I did. She said, okay, I got this kid named Rick Orozco. He's going to be the first bilingual country artist. And we're going to take Ronna Reeves over it. We're going to, you guys are going to back up Gene Watson in Japan. And they love traditional music in Japan. All because of you. You said, look up this person. I followed through with it. And that was the first step in my Nashville journey. So I always remember situations like that where I'm like, what if I was, what if I could be like Tom and I could, I could introduce people, be a connector, give people advice, help them along their journey, give them that first step towards achieving their dreams. And that's what you did, man. I appreciate it, man. Well, I mean, that's, that's all about, I mean, Musicians as a whole, but I think especially drummers have fraternity. To me, that it's it's always been a fraternity. It, yeah. We've always been this sort of stick together group. Um, stick even all together. the way back to st yeah, you like that? See what I did there? <laughs> I wish um, I had a splash symbol. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, shit. Even at even at UNT, I remember walking into the practice rooms and going past like all the guitar the guitarists and the classical piano players and all that stuff and they would always have like the newspaper taped up over the window you know so you couldn't see what they were practicing or how they were doing this or uh, the yeah. other and i walk you walk into the back where the drums are and it's just like you know you walk by you hear something cool that like dan wojahowski he was playing you knock on the door and it was just like dude show me that and it was like okay here it is you know it was always the sharing part of, you know, part of the community, which, you know, I've always been that way. Um, you know, it's just, you know, you were a buddy of mine and I knew you were starting this new journey and it was yeah. just like, dude, you know, I, I remember, I think, I think Judy was actually, she was in charge of um, the time I went over to Japan. With Country gold. Chicks. Country, country gold country charlie gold. nagatani yeah charlie what's up charlie? yeah yeah <laughs> i mean those are life-changing um, experiences man incredible yeah and i mean that's the thing you never know you know even the simplest thing it's i mean it took me two seconds to give you that contact but and a lot of people you know, are just but, too precious they're too selfish they're too insecure they they're too nah. lazy there's a million reasons right but i was just uh, talking to a friend you know who's kind of like a film industry like he's a comedian he interviews a lot of actors and he's like he goes i'm a connector you're a connector it's just this god-given um trait 
this personality trait that we have, and it just feels good to connect people and to help bring people together so they can collaborate and form new relationships and then just try to change their life. So you changed my life, and that was 25 years ago, and I bought a house. I mean, you know what I mean? <laughs> 20, I mean, 25 years ago in Nashville, I'm like, dude, I just want to you know, be playing at the same pace that I was in Dallas, and that took a while to get off the ground because, you know, when you start a new scene, a lot of times... Um, you want your reputation to precede you, but man, in Nashville, it's a, it's a not. Don't show me what you've done. It's like show me what you can do right now. You know what I mean? So yeah. you almost have to yeah. just kind of start over. So, yeah. but thank you, thank you, brother. Oh, you know, I'm glad it, it obviously worked out. And that makes me happy, man. It's 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 like teaching. You know, when you see one of your students actually do something, or they're playing on an award show, or playing on somebody's record, it was just like. Yeah, you get yeah. you know it's the same sort of feeling, man. Now just, you have a lot of a lot a lot of background at teaching. Um, what are you teaching right now? Like, what's your? I'm not, man. You know, after after going to PASIC, it you know after Robert's retirement, I'm sort of in the process of figuring out what my next chapter is going to look like. That's exciting because you know, it's exciting. It's nerve wracking. It's scary as shit um, because it's it's a different world than when I sort of went into the Robert Earl cocoon, you know, <laughs> yeah, there's something, there's something pretty amazing about having a, being gainfully employed in this insane business. And I'll be coming up on 25 years myself, um, very, very soon. And it, there's, there's something like magical that happens with that, um, that sense of security that you have in a great gig like that. So 25 years, man, incredible. Yeah incredible so yeah. we'll, we'll, let's get into that's that like grind almost, man that's like almost half my life man you i mean know? that's, it's just that's like, exciting i just i just turned 57 and you know and i'm grateful for every minute of those 25 years because we're you know, exactly Robert, five years of five years apart we're exactly five years apart same as i think oh, me and wojo and you went to school with yeah. wojo that makes sense yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so you know and i'm i'm grateful and and robert you know, it's like Robert took such great care of us. We had health insurance through the band. We had retirement system set up. We had all this stuff, which I know does not exist in the real world. It does not. You know, so it was just like I was sort of I was sort of living in Disneyland for like the last 25 years. And all of a sudden, somebody drops me off in the middle of New York. And I'm trying to figure out what the hell I'm going to do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, after I after I went to PASIC, um, uh, you know, with all the technology and teaching and stuff like that, and and I've done, I have some, you know, done some remote recordings, and I have that set up here, but I never really thought about it, applying that to teaching. Um, and you know, I'm I'm toying with getting back into that. You yeah. Know, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, see, see where everything takes me. And obviously I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm networking like crazy. I think I shot you an email or a text message and it was just like, Hey, I'm not retired. Robert retired. I still want to play. You yeah. Know? It's just like, I mean, you know, between Robert and the chicks, I was on the road for over 30 years, you know, and it's yeah. just like, you can't, it's hard to get that out of your, out of your system. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm doing a lot of networking and thinking the teaching. Um, I'm actually toying with, um, you know, just as a sort of a side hustle thing, doing this uh, sort of like a, almost a drum, it, like a drum. I, I'm thinking of calling it drum RX which, you know, I can get vintage kits and refurbish them and stuff like that. Mm. Um, because during the pandemic, when we were shut down, I basically went into my storage unit and, you know, basically deep cleaned all my kits, my vintage Ludwig kit. I have this uh, 80s uh, Yamaha recording series that, you know, I bought brand new off of, out of Brook Mays in Dallas. Yeah. You know, so I was deep cleaning all that stuff, and I ran across these two vintage snare drums that, I stupidly had ripped the 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 wraps off of one was like a a mid sixties Gretsch, one was a late sixties Rogers, and of course I wanted to match my drum, so I was just like, oh, oh this pearl finish, fuck it, you know. Um, oh, can we say that? Is this sure? Totally of oh, course, okay. totally. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Um, 
so yeah so i I got those two drums and I'd, i'd played them on sessions and stuff but it was just like i have time now so i started researching i found and i got the original colored wraps from this company in in Canada, and then I went through the whole sanding and prepping, and, oh, wow. and actually rewrapped and buffed everything. And it it was kind of cool. I had this really s- sense of satisfaction of connecting with the drums in a different way of sort of bringing them back to life. Awesome. Almost. Well, you have to be very so, patient, you know. To, you know, and then and then you know at the end of it's doing that, patient. there's something very. Uh, there's something very physical, uh, visceral that you have that you can touch and hold, and yeah, yeah. I've always, I've always been into woodworking, and you know, I've built mantelpieces and cabinetry and stuff like that just in my off time. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was there was something there was something cool about doing that and bringing these these drums that you know they weren't neglected, but they they were definitely abused of having their skin ripped off of them, but. <laughs> Drum drum I, I RX. Put him, I put him drum RX. So yeah. You better lock out that lock down that dot com, man. You know, you want to get I stuck know, with dot org. Yeah. <laughs> or dot CC or whatever the <laughs> hell those things are. I don't even know what those dots are anymore, man. That's crazy. Yeah, no, I think the CC is Canada and then you, you know you can have your dot biz dot org. You know, you don't want to get stuck with those. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but well, so. well, that's badass, dude. But I mean, okay, the monster in the room is twenty five years with this, you know, iconic troubadour, Texas troubadour. You know, his music is all about the folk and the country and the bluegrass and the rock blending. Twenty albums under his belt. You know, his songs are covered by George Strait, Joe Ely, Ely, Lyle Lovett, Nancy Griffith. How many of his records did you play on? I mean, you've you've been there a long time. Oh gosh. Um Everything from 1997 on. So um, I think he had four, four or five records out before I joined. Interesting. And then I did, I did everything beyond that. So you know, at least fifteen, fifteen records. And you guys usually record in Nashville or Austin. No, we we've always recorded in Austin. Um, The last, the last four or five records that I did with Robert, we recorded this place out in Dripping Springs, just west of Austin. Um, had a really good vibe. It was on this sort of big ranch type thing, but it, um, it was good. And, you know, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it was, it was a lot of, uh, a lot of really cool work that we did. And, and the thing I liked about Robert too, was that none of his albums really sound the same. You know, one can be like this loopy, you know, that I always called him up before we, we started recording and I was just like, okay, what's the vibe of this record going to be? Yeah. What should I bring? Should I bring all the weird things or should I bring a drum set? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's been everything from, you know, he was just like one on one of them. He said, I just want it to be, you know, really punchy and a lot, a lot of, lots of vocal padding and this, that, and the other thing more highly produced. Another one, he just wanted it real more acoustic driven. And he said, don't bring any cymbals. <gasps> and I was just like, really? And he goes, no, I'm serious. Don't bring any cymbals. <laughs> so um, I did the entire record with no cymbals. So, yeah. you know, I had all my percussion, you know, I put rattles on this and, you know, have a bow run on top of the snare and do, you know, just come up with, you know, just trying to find these different textures to make each, yeah. each track that, sound that, right. Well, well, that's fun. I mean, a lot, it's, it's so great. And and I heard some, like, there's this song, I Gotta Go. It sounds like there's like a some hand claps or like, you mm-hmm. know, like the Gypsy Kings kind of a thing on that, like a loop. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you create that and then you play on top yeah. of it? Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I I had uh, it was actually this old um, I don't know if you know what it is a ham bone where you're yeah. like slapping your leg and doing this stuff and it was this sample of somebody doing a ham bone. Of course, it was a lot faster. So on on that we slowed it down and changed you know did some stuff with effects and EQ and all that stuff. Um, because Robert had brought the song in and he said, I just want this sort of finger picking plucky sort of thing underneath. And, 
and uh, Lloyd Maines was producing it, and and he's he's always he always tells me to bring my computer with all my loop library and Ableton and all that stuff on it. And he was just like, "Hey, do you have do you have a loop thing that we can use for the click?" And I was just, and I was listening to the the sort of the picking pattern, and that hambone thing just came into my brain, and I was just like, "Yeah, we can do this." And I played it for him, and and so I loaded it into Ableton, slowed it down, and that pretty much became just the the main part of that and the finger picking pattern on the on the uh, on the guitar that was pretty much the entire song it totally makes yeah. it you know and you so you just take that wave file load it into the spdsx fire it off the spdsx yeah now what happens if does would robert get into the things where he's like hey man let's go um up two clicks tonight on that song and it's a wave file and you can't do that yeah um, on those, I made it pretty clear that that was an impossibility. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, on the loops and stuff, I mean, sometimes he would, you know, he would want some things faster, slower. And, you know, a lot of times we would, he would come after a show. We, if we'd be out a couple weeks or something like that, he'd come, come to me about three or four shows in. And it's just like, man, this song just, it, I'm having a hard time getting the word out. Can we bring it down? You know, and I was just like, sure. yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just a matter of going like that and punching it in and we're done. So, yeah. Um, so yeah. And there was always adjustments. And I mean, even, even the songs that we did, not necessarily, I got to go um, with the loop stuff, but that, that did change a little bit, but things like his his song road goes on forever or, or dreadful selfless crime or something like that to where he had been playing it for 30 years and i've been playing it for 20 something years over those 20 years it had morphed into so many different things to where somebody would have an idea it's just like hey let's try this and and for a long time like on dreadful selfless crime is this slow sort of um it was a slower feel, but it def definitely had a rock thing to it. And so, it, but it starts out at the beginning very sparse. And um, rather than me playing just lightly on the drums, I was just like, hey, why don't I come up with this loop that the bass, bass can play with? And then when we all come in for this verse, it's just, it just explodes. Right, right. And so we ended up doing doing that arrangement for like, 10 years you know so he was always open to changing things around and trying different things and even just i mean he we would take in songs that we've been playing for you know for a long time completely deconstruct them and build them up in a different version with different feel different drum parts different everything you know? nice so, yeah well i was gonna say with a songbook that vast you guys have 20 albums and he he wasn't necessarily the guy that got all sorts of like commercial you know music row radio play right it was more of like underground Correct, yeah. you know like um just that underground following year after year these i'm sure the fans are just thick as thieves like try to oh try. yeah yeah absolutely i mean they've you know they've been supporting and growing you know, from the time I started, I mean, even, even when I started my first show with them was at uh, tramps in New York city. And I had like four days to prep for the gig. And cause he just, he called me on the phone, like on a Sunday night. And then I met everybody at the airport on Thursday, flying to New York, you know, to play like five shows up in the Northeast. And, and I knew of Robert, um because yeah, how'd, how'd you get the gig man how'd you get the gig it was through lloyd mains there you go okay who's, who's not who's natalie mains's father okay. um natalie's with the of course the singer with the chicks and i had known him working with the chicks he, he just came in played steel on some stuff and played some shows and so you know after i left the chicks i was just kind of freelancing around dallas and teaching at the arts magnet and doing stuff like that and he just calls me on a Sunday and he was just like, Hey, what do you got going the next week? And I was just like, nothing. I can't get out of what do you, what do you got going? You know? Cause I love Lloyd. He's, he's like my, my mentor and what I aspire to because he's, I've never heard anybody say anything bad about Lloyd Mates in That's my great. life. Yeah. And so I was thinking, you know, 
I want to be like that guy when I grow up. So he called me up and, and he said, yeah, Robert's, Robert's got a, you know, this, this run that he needs to, to have covered. And I was like, have him give me a call. And, um, so yeah, he sent me the overnighted me the stuff. I got it on Monday, met everybody on Thursday. Um, and then played Friday at, at Tramps in New York to start it off. And what blew me away was that, I mean, everybody in the crowd was singing every single line, to every single song, yeah. you know, to where it was just like, holy, I mean, it was so much energy and so much coming back, you know, that That's was fun. just like, oh man, it's unbelievable. I mean, you know that, you know, that feeling when it's well, just... You know, the first time I felt like, that was with Pam Tillis. You know, when I got that Pam Tillis job in 1999, I was like, these people know every word to the song. It's not like I'm playing at Club Memphis and we're just like wallpaper top 40 band. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was yeah. a cool feeling. So was it kind of like a um, an indirect type audition? Did he fall in love with your playing and be like, hey, man, we don't have a drummer right now. Do you want to be the yeah, drummer? Yeah, he, he had actually... he. Had, the, I guess on the Saturday before he called me, <laughs> like 24 hours before he called me, <laughs> he had actually let his other drummer go. And I never asked one way or the other. So, you know, as far as I knew, I was just going to cover this thing. And, and I think he, you know, in talking to him over the years, he appreciated that I came in completely pre prepared. He, so he I gave knew, you a set list and said, let's start here. Learn this. I won't do any audibles. Yeah, I won't do any audibles, but he gave me like um, probably 35 or 40 songs to know because nice. he changes he changes the show every single night. Wow. No matter what, and always has. So he gave me like 35 or 40 songs, and I charted them out. And, of course, this was before we had – playlists on your computer or your phone. And so I was like going through his CDs on with my cassette tape machine and, God. you know, making a, making a tape to learn all these tunes and charted everything out, tempos, you know, intros, just like, you know, the charts that you show yeah. on your website and stuff. Yeah. And so when I met everybody at the airport in Dallas, Robert was just like, okay, let me, you know, so we're going to do this. And, and, you know, these, these songs, do you have any problem, any questions? I was like, no, man. And, and I showed him all my charts and he was just like, what, what are those? And I said, these are all your songs, man. You know? And he was just like, really? <laughs> he had never experienced that. He before. must've had like the previous drummer must just have been a complete uh, pocket feel guy, you know, no, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was, you know, but for me sort of preparing for that gig, it was just like, you know, for those four days, I was just living with those tunes and chart making sure the charts were accurate with what was going on. And um, just, you know, like I've always told my all my students, it's just like, you need to over-prepare. Over-preparation. Yeah, well, that's what got yeah. you the job, man. Incredible. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, at the end of that run, um, there was a couple other dates that he had me covered. And then by like the, you know, the third date after that first Northeaster run is when he offered me the job for full, full time. Amazing. Now, now yeah. how does that, how does that work with the, the changing the set list every night? So is he like email it to everybody in the morning in a very like methodical fashion, or it's just like, Hey man, here's oh the God, set list. I wish. Here's the set list an hour before the show. <laughs> and then you all immediately have to go in to put your thinking cap on like, Oh, make little Sharpie notes. Don't forget to go to the Jembe on the breakdown here. And, Sometimes it's, um, I mean, there over the 25 years, there were times where we would get it li literally like 10 minutes before the show. And yeah, and there's always been sort of like, you know, sort of surprises to where it's just like, oh shit, we haven't played this song in like two years. So everybody's like getting their iPhones out and we're listening to it. And it's just like, okay, I'm counting this. And then, Okay, you, the fiddle takes the first solo because I was I was the uh, Robert. You're the Kennedy musical director, like right? The last, yeah. yeah. So we were just kind of going over everything, you know, and it was just like that would be the first thing that I would do when I looked at the set list. It was just like, okay, any surprises, you know, anything that goes on. Um, but yeah, I mean, because there was at one point when we had a uh, on the farewell tour, we had a uh, actual guitar tech come in. 
and he was getting with the guitar player and fiddle player every night, kind of going over what the, all the changes and stuff. And he was like keeping all his set lists with all his notes. And I was just like, dude, I have a whole database of like songs and who plays what and tempos and keys and everything else. I said, See, let me just send it to you. That's nice. Because, you know, you know so it's, I, it's, it's hard to find a really, really, really top pro guitar tech that's going to knock it out of the ballpark um, with the same show every night. I can't imagine yeah. that, you know, but but something tells me like Robert's kind of the guy that's like, I, you know, he's not the guy that would be like, hey, man, I don't like dead time. Like we got it's just like a dance band. We got to go once. He's probably telling stories. We'll count yeah. this song off when I'm ready. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So and, so that helps. And that was the thing working with him. You know, it's just like there were some there were some stories he'd tell. I sort of knew when it was nearing the end. Other times he would just, you know, stop and there'd be a little bit of dare and then he wouldn't like motion to me or anything. And I'm thinking, OK, I think he's done. So <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll count. I think I'll count this off now. But yeah. yeah, I mean, there was there was a lot of there was a lot of flow, you know, things that that we did to you know there was there were some songs that went back to back always you know just and we'd sort of worked out these transition things but pretty much everything else was you know and it kept us on our toes it kept him on his toes it was different every night because we would uh with our fan base we would literally have people come to like four or five shows in a row in different cities yeah. And they now, would just follow us around like the Grateful Dead or something. And that's awesome. And you treat them to this new experience every night. And I think there is something very um, visceral about that, that, that where there's like a slight tension in the air if, the, if there can be some prizes and things are different. And there, there's something about the energy from a group of musicians that are that are like in the moment. Um, you know, because we, we picked the 24 songs at the beginning of the year and it is that way till the end of the year. And then we, oh, might, yeah. have, we might have people that come to 10 shows but they're going to see the same thing unless a new single comes out in the middle middle of the year and then we'll go to a sound check learn that song stick it in somewhere else yeah. um now how long well, were his shows uh, two hours three hours uh, like like uh, um with Robert, well on the farewell on the farewell tour the minimum was two hours we did two and a half sometimes um did you get a pee know, break no <laughs> You always got to ask the, 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 the drummer in, uh, that are over 50 club. You're like, hey, did you get a pee break? Did he do an acoustic song? <laughs> nope. Nope, man. We were out there the entire time. You know, come yeah. hell or high water, we were going to stick that one out. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it would be, you know, for, for a long time, it, you know, we'd do at least 90 minutes. I mean, we never did the George Jones of like, you know, playing – 74 minutes and 30 seconds and we're you know that's that's all we're gonna play yep. no matter what but uh but yeah i mean on you know like on on y'all shows there's so much more production mm. going on with everything i mean you guys are working with pyro you're working with all this other stuff yeah. to where you can't really change that stuff around yeah um the only the surprising thing for me was like you know, um we did like three three or four different uh like tour stints with uh with the dave matthews band over the years where we yes. opened up for him and what blew me away is their set changed every night wow but it's just like all of their tech guys and of course they're not doing pyro and stuff like that but even their ld you know he, he was he had to change settings and all this other stuff but for the most part he was i was sitting back at the front of house one show and he was literally playing the light board like like an instrument. You know, he was he was grooving off of what was going on stage at the same time that they were on stage. That's awesome. So it was just, you know, but you know, he'd been with them for thirty something years too. Yeah. So. What were your some of your favorite um tunes to play? It seems like this one song here, Feeling Good Again, is kinda like his uh you know, that's his like let it be. It's very popular. That's, yeah, that's that was fun. Um, for me, just getting the, the the emotional reaction from the audience is what made it fun fun for me. Um, like that that one always as soon as as soon as we started into the intro with the guitar and basically I'm just playing sixteenth notes on a frame drum the entire time, but it just just sort of getting that 
that fundamental groove going. And as soon as we, as soon as everybody recognized the chord changes and that was the song, that wave of energy that comes, comes across. I yeah. mean, that's, that's to me, that's what makes the shows. That's what makes the songs. I mean, it's like we, uh, we did an opening slot for George Strait at uh, Reliance Stadium in Houston. And um, it was actually us and Lyle's, Lyle Levitt's band. We were both on stage at the same time. So not only were we playing in Reliance Stadium, but I was sitting next to Russ Kunkel the entire night. Oh, Russ, Russ was playing with the with the Lyle. Is he yeah. still doing that? Uh, yeah. yeah. Whatever happened to that up? drummer Dan of his that he had for a while? Nashville Dan Tomlinson. Cat. Dan Tomlinson. Yeah. Yeah. Last time I heard, he was out in Phoenix or something. Ah. Yeah. But sun yeah, chaser. Yeah, yeah. A sun chaser. I am too, man. I this this weather in Nashville, it blows, man. <laughs> Don't you have a good place in out in L.A. now? Uh, we, I, yeah, I, I'm gonna kind of let it go for a little bit. I, but I love. I'm a sun worshiper, buddy, man. I love it. Yeah, I do. Yeah, being in Texas for however many years, man, it's just. I just can't. I'm getting to the point where I can't deal with the 105, 107 degree, you know, summers and shit. And it's yeah. just like, oh my god, it's like get me to Vermont, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm, hey, I'm going to be in Austin, man, um, February um, 15, 16. So, oh, really? so pencil it for me. It's a it's a Wednesday and Thursday. If you're around, um, taking that Thursday off, I'll be free at like 11 a.m. and I want to go like get some uh, uh, Tex Mex or barbecue. Oh, I can I can recommend tons of places for both. Yeah, maybe some Taco Cabana gets you know. Uh, people say uh, what's taco the deal with Taco Cabana? I love it, dude. Man. You know, it's it's like the Starbucks of Mexican food. It's consistent. <laughs> <laughs> it's consistent road food is the way I look at it. <laughs> so what's what's your go-to uh, Tex-Mex spot in Austin? Um probably Maudie's. Mm. Okay. Maudie's it is. Maudie's rocks. I, I think they have the best enchiladas in town. There you go. Now if you want the best enchiladas in the world, you have to go down to Herbert's Taco Hut in San Marcos. Well, dude, that sounds amazing. That's yeah. Isn't they, that where Texas are, State is? Uh, mm -hmm. Texas, yeah, yeah, because I've been there a million times to do those my little clinics for uh, Carrie, my buddy Carrie Clear from 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 school. She's the teacher there, and she never took me there. Oh man, you got to go to Herbert's, man. Right. Next time you're there, Herbert's all the way. Shoot, yeah, shoot me a text, man. I'll meet you down there. Yeah, man. Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll be pinging you for sure. So tell me about the other guys in the band. Were they there as long as you? Um, the bass player was there actually for 27 years. Amazing. Um, and it, the, at the very end, um, the fiddle player who also ended up playing guitar, acoustic and electric guitar and just freaking killed everything you picked up is picked up to play. Um, he was with us for like eight, eight or eight and a half years, something like that. He came in when we did the bluegrass album in 2015. No. Yeah. I guess it was seven years. Um, yeah, he came in for 2015. He just started playing the fiddle and nothing else, just on the bluegrass, because we did an entire year of touring to where I was just playing a 16-inch kick drum standing up with a 12-inch snare. And, oh, I saw a video and from uh, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the the Wolf Den at the, uh, oh, Mo yeah. the Mohegan. Yeah. Yeah, man. So... Yeah, it was it was a long time for everybody. It wasn't uh, wasn't like new people every tour for sure. So how does that come up? Is it uh, was it, were you guys all on one bus or did Robert have his own bus? No, we were all on one. That's nice. It's yeah. very familial. Um, yeah. So what happens? How does that how does that happen? Uh, you know, one morning over coffee, it's like, guys, um, I want to go out on top like Seinfeld, and. <laughs> we're um we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna stop in about a year like how did that happen um it was actually not a lot different than that um i guess last january um because you know we our decembers are usually really crazy because robert has this the christmas song so we devised entire tours over to where we, we would be gone for like the entire month of December doing these crazy ass Christmas shows with costume sets, all kinds of shit. So that kind of wears everybody out. 
Um, but yeah, he, he sent out an email to everybody and it was just like, Hey, I want everybody to come out to the ranch and, uh, we're having a, a sort of a company wide meeting, you know, um, with, you know, cause he had an office staff, he had like four or five people in the office and, you know, then the band and the tour and the crew and all, everybody was going to be there. Yeah. So I had a feeling something important was going down just because, you know, it's just like, you know, you never, he's never called one of these before. So yeah, we all go out there and, um, it was on a Thursday and he said, tomorrow we're releasing this statement that I am going to be retiring from touring on September 4th of this year. Wow. And it was just like, Oh, holy shit you know and it's just like you know i'm happy for him that he's at a point to where he can do this and he feels good about it but yeah. you know my instant you know my instant reaction internally was like oh holy shit you know um but it was you know and at that point what he did he cleared out the entire calendar for the what he had already booked and then basically booked the farewell tour, which was the only venues that he wanted to play. Um, you know, that he, he's always had a good experience. at. Oh. And, um, so yeah, we started off doing a couple, couple weeks here and there. And then from middle of May until September 4th, I think I was home like 11 days. Wow. We did. So, we did like seventy-eight shows in that time. So that's kind of like when you call the old lady and you're like, "Hey, meet me in Kerrville," or you know, hey, "Meet me, meet me at the. We got two nights at this place. It's we're at the W yeah. Hotel." Yeah, and it's it's like the you know the last show of you know the Southeast Run is in Charlotte, and then the next show's in San Francisco. So the bus you know hauls ass for three days. You get to fly home, spend about 36 hours at home, get on another plane, then go to, you know. Wow. It was definitely like that. Yeah. You know, it was, it was, it was brutal. <laughs> it was, it was the most intense touring experience I've had because, I mean, Robert's schedule, we, we toured all year, but we wouldn't go away for more than two or three weeks at a time, max. Nice. And then all of a sudden, this was like, you know, Us too, 111 man. days were yeah. just gone. You know, it was just, it was crazy. So what does he, does he have interests, other interests, or is he like, you know, some people have some hobby and it just kind of just starts to take over and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, he has, I mean, he has a, a big ass ranch out, out between uh, Medina and Kerrville huh. out, in, down, out in the hill country. Um, I guess his hobby is that ranch. He's always out there putzing around doing stuff. Um, during the pandemic, he, um, uh, turned one of the barns into a video production house nice. that we were doing all the streaming and filming for stuff through. Um, but yeah, he's, he said he's not retiring from music. He's just retiring from touring. Interesting. So I think he's going to continue songwriting. He's got a, uh, the Americana podcast that he does. Um, and he's, he was talking about sort of mentoring, you know, some artists along the way. And yeah, you know, sort of like we were talking about, you know, sort of passing, passing knowledge along and helping yeah. people. Yeah. I hope I get to see him again because I could say, hey, man, one time in 1999, you were playing a 328 performance hall. I was looking for my buddy Tom and I knocked on your bus door and you came out and I was wearing a really shiny bowling shirt like um, Charlie uh, from uh, Two and a Half Men. And you said, hey, Tom, one of the Backstreet Boys is here to see you. And I was like, is that his sense of humor? Oh, kind of yeah. like roasting people? Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice. No, he had a, he always had a great sense of humor. And, I mean, we had a lot of fun on the road. But, yeah, uh, but yeah no, he would always, you know, you know, like one time I, I was wearing this, like, red shirt. And, he'd, you know, he'd come up and it was just like, hey, man, you know, there's somebody, some people who can really wear red. And he said, Unfortunately, you're not one of them. <laughs> <You know? laughs> He'd hate this studio. Everything is red. No, I know. I know. Uh, oh, my God. But, no, I mean, it, but he could take it as well. I mean, we, you know, even, even it was never really, it was sort of an underlying thing to where he was, he was the boss. He was the name and we were there support. 
but he tried he treated everything as a band situation which was yeah. really amazing too yeah um and he was you know he rode the same bus with us he had the same size bunk as everybody else oh he didn't take and the back so, lounge that's always a nice sign when they when they're like no he, jump in the bunk yeah he he took the back lounge on the farewell tour about i guess about june i think he was maybe mid-june he was sort of starting to fray and need a little bit more space and you know privacy to to do his thing so we Interesting. swapped some things out and did that but uh wow. but no i mean we would we, be able to rip him just back just as hard as he ripped us <laughs> well they, if you dish it you gotta be able to take it man that's so, right man you know you know when i'm looking at this and all these all these other folks you know singer songwriter types you've worked with the bonnie rates and the cheryl crows and the willie nelsons and you know have you have you discovered a commonality with high level professional um artists or slash singers songwriters is there is there is there a string that runs through it all how can you successfully navigate all those different personalities and like if there's a drummer that's listening to this or a musician you're like well i want to be able to do that what's a survival strategy you know um i guess the survival strategy um comes a little bit of what we talked about before just being prepared or being overly prepared um you have to convey a sense of confidence um in in your own playing and be able to relate that to whatever artist you're backing up um because like the the first show that i played with robert i said look my job here is to make you as comfortable on stage while you're performing as I possibly can. So if there's anything you need, anything you want to do, you know, let me know and we'll get it done. And I think that immediately puts, you know, puts the artist at ease. Yeah. Um, on one of the ACL Hall of Fame shows that I did, um, Nora Jones was, uh, we were inducting uh, Ray Charles and she was singing two Ray Charles songs. And what's interesting is she was a student of mine when I was teaching at Arts Magnet. And that, wow, Nora Jones, nice. Yeah. So when she came on stage for rehearsal, she came up and gave me a big hug and, you know, we were just talking, shooting shit. And she goes, you know, all the time I've known you, this is the first time we've actually played together. Crazy. You know, like, wow, I just didn't even realize, you know, and, and we had run into each other different times on the road, you know, we're playing the same, same city or we're stopped fueling at the same truck stop or whatever. Um, but, you know, I pretty much told her the same thing, you know, I said, you know, because on one of the songs, she said, I want to do just like this version of Willie, Willie's thing. So on that version, um, you know they they were using sticks and doing this and and so she we started in the rehearsal she stopped everything and she was just like i just don't like the the sticks and i was just like okay i have an entire bag of brushes rods whatever let's find a sound you're comfortable with see love it um and so i went through each one and hit and she was just like okay i like those and it's like okay we'll do that and then she was just like i'm not a fan of ride symbols and you know and I think she felt uncomfortable because I had you were her teacher. I yeah. was her teacher at one point. So I just said, and she goes, I don't want to tell you what to do. I said, Nora, I said, that's my gig. I said, that's my gig right now is to make you happy and comfortable. Yeah. Us so, being yelled at, we're used to it. That's our yeah. job. <laughs> <laughs> no. I've been yelled at by worse people than you. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but no, I mean, and, and I think that, immediately put her at ease because yeah. i didn't i didn't think about it at the time that she she was still kind of seeing me as the as a teacher and not wanting to Im impose her own wants or needs on what i was doing well that's sweet that she re that and she respected your history you know that's sweet yeah yeah but it you know but at the same time it's just like you know the tables the tables in turn we were we're equals of course she's won a few more grammys than i have um <laughs> but you know just me saying that put everything at ease yeah you know and i think that's that's a part of you know like you like you had mentioned 
you know, working with all these different artists is just, you know, if, if you go in with confidence, it's going to make them feel like you've got your shit together. Um, and then if they have anything to suggest or whatever, just be open and because your job is that support role. And if you're in that space, then, you know, there's hardly any problems at all. Yeah. So you're, so you're confident, you're, you're prepared, but you're also incredibly flexible and can change mm -hmm. things in the moment. So that's, that's well, the key. It's, 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 yeah. I mean, it's like being in the studio to where you, you're playing something one way and then the producer kind of comes, ah, I just don't like the vibe. Try something else. Do that. You know, yeah. you have to be open to, you know, that feedback from other sources, whether sure. it's, you know, just as drummers, you're not just going to listen to another drummer giving you feedback. You have to listen to the producer that, you know, and even, some drumming ideas, you know, uh, come from, you know, the, they can come from guitarists or bass players too. I mean, they're, you know, I never closed myself off of to who I listened to. I mean, Absolutely. I was, I was playing this one session and, uh, you know, it's just like, we were trying to get the feel right. And then the guitarist was just like, Hey man, just, just try like, you know, just, the you know, this one, I forget what Eagle song it was. Like, I can't tell you why or something like that, where it's just super, super simple, hardly any fills, you know, um, you know, but that was, you know, sort of changing that mindset, just flipped a switch. And I was just like, okay, I'm going to do this instead. And, yeah. you know, it sort of made everything else gel on top of it. So. Yeah, man. So the confidence, a team spirit and the ability to take take direction and not be offended um which is something that i learned in the high school jazz band man i was just like you're oh, gonna yeah. be told things get off the right symbol do the spit the spit on the hi-hat or let's do brushes instead of sticks or can you not bury the bass drum bit or you stop playing your duple <laughs> rock fills during a count basie song um all that stuff, man. So, well, that's exciting. And then uh, we have to ask the question. I think that you're the guy that turned me on to Sabian Symbols. What, what's the gear? What's the gear that you've been with for a while? Um, I've been with Sabian since, God, 99. Nice. Um, that's amazing. I've been with Mapex about the same time. Mm -hmm. I've been playing Mapex drums from since, like, 99 or 2000, maybe. Um, I've been with Aquarian Drumheads since, God, 93, mm. almost 30 years now. Amazing. Holy shit. Dude. What is going on, man? Um, and then I've been with uh, Innovative Percussion for like the last four or five years. Yeah, I guess. George and the guys, man, here in Nashville. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Really, really good yeah, stuff. I was, I was with Promark for like 26 years and then uh, I switched over to – over to innovative about four or five years ago. So. Yeah, I think because because I was with uh, Regal Tip and then I was with Johnny Rab and then you said, "Hey man, call Stacy at Promark." <laughs> I remember. See, you're responsible for this all this stuff, man. Hey man, it's like it's like Lloyd Baines and me. I mean, every every cool gig that I've had in my life, you know. That's why I even told him after after Robert retired, I was just like, dude. You've got me Robert's gig. You've got me in on the ACL things. I knew you when we were playing with the Dixie Chicks. All the cool gigs that I've had in my career, you've gotten me. So get on your horse and find me another damn gig. That's I, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he better <laughs> he better get a nice basket, a Christmas basket from Harry and David's or something like that. Oh, absolutely. Man. Yeah, he, no, he's, he's the he's the guy. He's 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 my dude, man. Well, who were your, uh, you know, I'm just trying to get these last two questions in because I, people be like, I can't believe they had a great conversation, but Rich never asked them who his favorite drummers were. Oh, who were your God. influential guys? Like, I mean, it's really hard, you know, because anybody that ever hits a drum, I am stealing something from them. You know what I mean? There's oh, yeah. something about their playing that I'm going to enjoy. But oh, who, yeah, was, who was your route, Mount Rushmore? Um, I guess the one that first got me sort of you know i was i was one of those kids who was always banging on shit so oh, yeah. my, you know even before i knew what drums were i think i was just hitting things um but the first time i really remember watching a drummer and just kind of being wow that's the coolest thing in the world was probably buddy rich on the tonight show yeah 
Um, then, gosh, I'm trying to think. Probably my two major influences were probably Gad and Percaro. Oh, there you go. Um, can't, can't go wrong with that. You know, it's just I, I remember it because I, I took lessons when I was in high school. I took lessons from Rick Latham when he was in Dallas. Yeah, and you know, studied out of his the out of his his man studies book even before it was a book. He was it, it was just like a loose book. binder of of he was handouts, just bringing right? me single sheet exercises and cool. it was just like well, work on this. Um, but after the lessons, it was cool. Cause he would always, if, if it was in the middle of the Saturday or something, he would always leave a slot of time afterwards. And he would, um, we'd, he'd go make some, some coffee or espresso. And we would just like, listen to whatever records at GAD or Percara were on, you know, that was when LPs, you could actually look at the record store and see who was playing on the tracks on the back of the yeah, LP. Yeah. And it was just like, okay, it's Precaro. I'm going to buy this one. I don't care who it is. It could be Leo Sayre. Yeah, you just want to know what they company. did. Yeah, what's yeah. that Leo Sayre song? Yeah, the sup, the the You make me feel like dancing. Yeah, that's Gad. That was Gad? That's Gad, man. That's like a disco roller skating hit. And Percaro did his, uh, oh God, what was that 12 8 ballad of his? Oh, it was a big ballad, yeah. Um, Le- Leo Sayers. Let's, uh, let's look it up here on the Spotify. Oh God, let's see if I can find it. Let's see if I can beat Spotify. Let's see, and you're in the cranium, your cobweb crami- cranium. I know, it's a senior moment. Man. Leo Sayers. Sayer. Um, ballad. When I Need You. When I Need You. That's Percaro. Doom, doom, That's Percaro. Dude, a lot of space. It was, it's a beautiful track. It's a beautiful track, it's a dude. It's a beautiful track. I did the man. same thing. I would buy, I would throw down the money to buy anything that my drumming heroes were on just to see. I would picture like the, the session and how it all went down and like why they chose the snare drum they did. And you know what I mean? Putting yourself mentally in that situation because it's like, I want this to be my job one day. People you know, bossing oh, me yeah. around in a recording studio. Yeah. You know? And like, you know, I would wear, I think there was like two, two or three Al Jarreau records that Gad and Percaro both played on that I just completely wore out. Yeah. I mean, it was just incredible, incredible playing. Yeah. Morning. And, this, dun, 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 oh, yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Dude. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, just the feel and how they worked into that. And it was interesting because I had a really cool conversation um, on one of the Austin City Limit things that I did. Uh, Boz Skaggs was one of the, uh, one of the guest artists of, um, you know, performing some of these stuff that, that, you know, that they were being inducted. And he and I were in catering and we just had this really kind of cool conversation about working with Percaro. You know, and the thing that's the thing that surprised me most is because I never really put a click or a metronome or time marking thing on any any of those things, even on uh, Boss Gags and stuff, which Percaro did pretty much everything that he did. And, you know, I was just like, man, his his time is so solid and his just feel is just it's it just has it has that confidence and it's there. And it's just but it's not overwhelming to where he's masking everything else yeah and boss said that he had this ability to be able to push choruses you know and but then come right back to where it was before to where it's you don't even notice it but it just kind of gives it this lift and but he but he was able to come back down just so it doesn't do the you know honky-tonk women thing where it's just faster and faster and faster faster, 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 you know yeah but it's it was just this thing to where it it was able to breathe, but he had it in such a musical, natural way that you didn't even you didn't even pick it up, you didn't even think oh. about it. 
but that feel was just so deep, man. Heavy, heavy. Well, just, how did you yeah. guys handle that with uh, with Robert? I mean, because it's it's some. I'm I'm assuming it's somewhat of a, it was an anti technology band in the sense that hey, this is a singer songwriter Americana. I mean, you want the tempos to be solid, you want them to be the same every night. But so was it, did it just depend on the song whether if there was a loop or a click or no click? It kind of, it, for a long time, it depended on the song. Um, I guess about. Six, six years before he left, it was just after, just before I became MD. Um, he sort of, you know, for a long time, we just had this big sounding stage and it was just loud as shit. And he was just like, we got to do something about the stage line. So, you know, I, I, at the time I was playing, you know, 22 by 18 kick and 12 and 16 and all these cymbals and shit. And, um, so at that point, um, I went down to like 20 inch kick, 10, 12, 14, you know, just sort of scale back a little bit. Um, and when that happened, I, it felt like I was fighting things a lot more musically trying to keep everybody together. So I, at that point I was just like, look, you know, even if it's just temporary, let me just play a click the entire time and you guys just listen to me you know we've had this sort of you know rock thing to where it's loose and it's a little bit freer but if yeah. we're going to do this at a lower volume it's harder for me to control what's going on you know not moving air yes you know? yeah yeah so you got to be a lot more tight and a lot more tuned in and so from that point on we pretty much used to click yeah um but um but yeah i mean it was it was it was interesting because robert really liked the the sort of the fundamental parts there was there were, he went through stages there was a time to where he just wanted these like rumbling loopy things like on feeling good again or there's just another one where it's hello new orleans to where you know i'm just playing 16th notes like on a drum and then doing some doing a couple overdub fills and this, that, and the other. And that's what he wanted. Um, there was a couple other ones to where he, he embraced the technology because there was one song called Train Track that he wrote that had like 13 verses that were 11 bar phrases. And it was just this really, really weird thing. But I had this idea of creating this like train beat loop, but then really heavily affecting it. So it sounded very mechanical. Um, because the song basically went from talking about this this horrible train wreck to, you know, in the future, this spaceship crashing. And it's sort of, you know, bringing the two together. So this mechanical chugging underneath would, you know, sort of be the glue for the whole thing. Yeah. Man. So he was he was really cool in that, except after we had recorded it, he was just like, how are we going to do this live? And it was right when the SBDS came out. And I was yeah. just like, I know this guy at Roland. Let me call him up. And that's when I started using the. Oh, that had to be like 2008 or one. Oh, even further back. That's how yeah. long we've had the SBDS. I think it's one of the greatest inventions in the, definitely the last decade or more oh, yeah. for the yeah. percussion industry. You know what I mean? It's like a, you got to have well, it. Well, especially the SX because it's so much more user friendly. Man, I'm loading loading the samples into the S. It was just like, oh my god! I mean, I'd do all the editing on Ableton and load it in, and still you'd have to like truncate the endpoints and do oh, this, yeah. and just that's, to get the. I mean, even that's going to go the way of uh, uh, that's going to become like Space Invaders. I mean, no, everyone's yeah. going to use the SX, you know. Um, <laughs> then you have to turn it off and blow into the cartridge, and then yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How do you troubleshoot that? You know, the, I learned that from our, our our monitor guy. Just blow on it first. Stage one, <laughs> any cable, any problem with the microphone, blow on it. Yeah. See, see if that helps things. <laughs> hey, listen, I I want to be respectful of your time, but I want to do the fast five. Fast oh. five fast questions. Favorite color? Uh, red. <laughs> All right. See, uh, fast food. Favorite food. Oh, favorite food, yeah. um, sushi. Beautiful, man. That's, I might go get some today. Favorite drink? Oh, my God. Um, when I was drinking, it used to be uh, Macallan. What's in that? 
It's 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 just a. I mean, it's a single malt scotch. Oh, got scotch. I haven't really yeah. gone into that no, world I was, yet. I was I was a scotch guy. Look at that, man. Yeah. Um, Converse or Vans? Oh, man, I got to go with Converse. I'm old. Yeah, yeah, you're right, man. I, I, I agree. <laughs> and then the last one, chocolate or vanilla? Come on. Got to go with chocolate, man. You got to go with the chocolate. All unless, right. Unless, unless you're doing vanilla with maple syrup poured on it. Coming from a guy from New Vermont, New Hampshire. Yep. Vanilla ice cream, maple syrup, sprinkled walnuts, the best thing in the world. Oh, my God. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Mm, there's nothing like real ice cream. You know, I'm lactose intolerant, so I do a lot of alternative milks, you know, like coconut milk ice cream or cashew milk ice There ain't nothing like some of that stuff from a cow oh, ripped yeah. up and frozen and just you're like, oh, my God, it's going to be a rough day tomorrow, but this is awesome. Oh, yeah. You know. There was one time we were on uh, vacationing up in uh, New Hampshire. We literally drove like a stone's throw from the Canadian border, and we were hanging out on a lake. And it was during the summer, so they had this ice cream stand open. And it was just like they had this maple walnut ice cream. That was the best ice cream I've ever eaten in my life. It was <sighs> so good. So. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I know. I need to stay away from it, man. Um, this has been so fun. For you guys that are listening, you want to connect with Tom, Tom Van Skyke, and that's Skyke is S-C-H-A-I-K, TomVanSkyke.com. You want to hire Tom to play on your record. You want to take some lessons with him. He's all about all that stuff, man. I can't thank you enough, man. I wanted to thank you just in this public forum for, for changing my life, man. I really appreciate it. Man. Oh, man. Um I'm glad to have you as a friend, man. Well, it's, uh, I appreciate it's, it. It's always been a pleasure. And, um, you know, you've always, anytime I've seen you out on the road, there's been a couple of times where, you know, you were playing with some somebody opening up for us in Chicago or something. And it was just like, what the hell are you doing here? And it's it's always a great time hanging out with you. That's funny. Yeah, I was playing with Amy Daly, man. That was the first yes. artist I ever played with in Nashville. Incredible. And she's yeah. married to our guitar player, Jack, and they moved to Florida in the last several years. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Oh, man, that's crazy. Florida guy now. I know, man. We're all on the move. Um, but this is so great. I really appreciate you, uh, you doing this. And to all the listeners out there, be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps people find the show and keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll be here. And happy holidays. Tom, thanks so much, man. Thank you, Rich, man. It's been a pleasure. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.